So I want to welcome everyone here and the live stream audience, which is part of why we have to start exactly on time, um, to the Sage Casbis Award Lecture, co-presented by Sage Publication and the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences, CASBIS, as we say. I'm Margaret Levy, and I'm the Sarah Miller McCune Director of the Center of CASBIS. And Sarah herself, Sarah Miller McCune, is sitting here. She's Sage's publishing founder, Sage's Sage Publications founder and executive chair. Um, and you'll hear from Sarah after the talk because she is going to actually give the award to Carol. Carol Dweck is the fifth Sage Casbis Prize Award winner. The award recognizes outstanding achievement in the behavioral and social sciences that advance our understanding of press, pressing societal issues. It underscores the role of the social sciences in enriching and enhancing public policy and good governance. Carol was selected via an open public nomination process, followed by the convening of a seven-person selection committee that included uh, Tony Breich, Jennifer Crocker, Renu Kator, Manuel Pastor, and William Julius Wilson, a previous winner. Past winners include Daniel Kahneman, who was a CASPIS fellow and also, by the way, a Nobel Prize winner in economics, um, sociologist and education rights activist Pedro Nagora, political scientist and former U.S. Census Bureau director and former fellow and former board of directors member of CASBIS, Ken Pruitt, and good friend of Sarah's and mine, and Iris, who's here, and sociologist William Julius Wilson, who was also a CASBIS fellow and many other things and on the board of directors. This year's winner, Carol Dweck, is the Lewis and Virginia Eaton Professor of Psychology at Stanford University. Carol is one of the most influential and pioneering scholars of the past three decades, with work spanning social psychology, developmental psychology, and personality psychology. She is renowned for the study of motivations and self-conceptions that guide human behavior. Specifically, she is the most high-profile founding figure of research on mindsets, which is probably why you're all here. Um, the beliefs that shape how people interpret challenges and setbacks. Her work established implicit theories of intelligence, growth mindsets, and fixed mindsets. A growth mindset, for example, is a starting point for further development and a learning through effort, help-seeking, and trying out new strategies. It leads individuals to believe learning comes from struggling with new challenges, thus enabling improved performance over time. Don't give up, keep trying. <laughs> this is just the starting point for Carol's work, and many of you have explored it through her best-selling book, Mindset, The New Psychology of Success, published in 2006. So what's happened since 2006? Well, Carol has done a lot, and you're going to hear about some of that in a few minutes. But CASPIS, I should point out, has also done a lot in this area to advance her theories, concepts, and approaches. I don't have time to tell you all about it, but we had a major multi-year project here on mindset, helping to create the Mindset Scholars Network, which is a very active and important project in the social sciences these days. And I do recommend that you read an absolutely incredible article that our own Mike Gattani wrote, detailing how we incubated that and how it developed. Um, we have hard copies outside if you want to see them. Um, and those watching on online or those who prefer online access can find the article on our website, easy enough to find. Carol herself was a consulting CASPA scholar the years that we initiated the Mindset Scholars Network here. So now let's turn to Carol herself. I hope you're as excited as I am to hear what she has to say and all that she's been doing and thinking about the range of issues to which she has made such an incredible contribution. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. 
Uh, in addition to honoring the people who made this possible, today I'd like to honor a concept, a beautiful concept, the concept of human potential. My career They're in. Mindsets can ignite or dampen people's motivation to learn. I will show today how research on mindsets speak to issues of education, work, inclusion, and equality. In short, the fulfillment of potential. Our work does this and has done it by countering the widespread belief in fixed abilities. It demonstrates that achievement, intellectual or otherwise, is not simply a function of some stable, measurable endowment, but instead is a function of the intertwining of motivation and skills to predict growth and to produce growth. In fact, I'll end by suggesting that's by suggesting that this is exactly how the brain works, the intertwining of motivation and skills to produce growth. And I'll also end, I warn you, I have several endings. <laughs> I'll also end by suggesting a vision of how this brain and the motivated person it lives in can optimally function in the larger world. So what drew me to this work? As infants, we all start out with an incredible set of learning skills and an insatiable, an insatiable kind of lust for learning. Uh, to illustrate this um, and, and to help you see what it looks like, here is a photo of her five-month-old nephew sent to me by a colleague. <laughs> This is a baby who just turned on a computer for the first time. Now, we all were like this. All, every person in this room was like this. But just a few years later, we start to see this. <laughs> and this. And just a few years later, this, isolated and discouraged. My life's work is about learning how to help kids retain that drive for learning or regain it if they've lost it. And along the way, we've discovered how mindsets play a role in this. When people are more in a fixed mindset, they're believing that their intelligence, their abilities are just fixed traits. You have a certain amount and that's it. But when they're in more of a growth mindset, they understand that intellectual abilities can be developed through hard work, but not just effort, through good learning strategies and lots of support and instruction from others. A growth mindset doesn't necessarily believe, um, imply that everyone's the same or anyone can do anything, but it is the belief that everyone can develop their abilities. Important to point out, nobody is a pure type. Nobody is all a growth mindset, no matter what they claim. We all can get triggered into a fixed mindset by big challenges, failures, criticism, being outperformed by someone we thought we were better at something than they are. Um, so then the idea is how do we get back into a growth mindset? How do these mindsets work? I'll give you a very whirlwind tour. They create different psychological worlds for people. In decades of careful... Um, systematic and rigorous work, we've shown that um, 
Growth and fixed mindset orient people toward different goals. If you think your abilities are fixed, you want to show them to advantage. You have the goal of looking smart, never dumb. But if you believe abilities can be developed, then that's what you want to do. So you take on challenges and pursue them in a way that leads to the growth of abilities. Effort, setbacks have different meanings. In a fixed mindset, they're both bad. Effort is taken as a sign that you lack ability. Listen, if you didn't, if you have to work hard, it means you're not naturally good at it. If you were naturally good at it, it would come easily. That's how the reasoning goes. In a, a growth mindset, that's one of the tools for learning. In a fixed mindset, setbacks, failures are the ultimate condemnation. But in a growth mindset, you know, failures aren't always welcome. You can be disappointed. But they're also part of learning, part of taking on challenges, and part of learning what to do next. So in that fixed mindset, you have a curtailing of challenge seeking and persistence. And in a growth mindset, you have the fostering, the support of challenge seeking and persistent, persistence leading to greater learning. I love this study by Mosher and his colleagues showing what happens in the brain when people in different mindsets encounter uh, mistakes, make mistakes. In the study, he had college students hooked up to an EEG machine. They worked on a task and periodically made errors. What happened when someone in a growth mindset hit the error? The brain caught fire. The error was deeply, deeply processed and learning took place. The error was co corrected when the same question came around again. People in more of a fixed mindset, the brain stayed cold. They did not want to engage with the error. They did not engage with the error. As a result, the learning did not take place and they were less likely to correct their error when the same question came around again. I want you to keep this brain this image in your head, because it will come around again. I won't show it again, but you'll have stored it. <coughs> Mindsets predict students' learning, especially in the face of challenge. When students are making difficult school transitions, uh, when they are lower achievers, when they face the challenges, of being from underrepresented minority groups. Take a look at this. This is a study we did um, of hundreds of students making the transition to junior high school, seventh grade. They entered with a pretty equal past um, achievement test scores from grade school. But as the two years of transition, as the time since transition of transition proceeded, their grades in math, the most challenging subject for most of them, pulled apart and continued to diverge over the next two years. That's how the mindsets work. Not long ago, we had the opportunity to study all of the 10th graders in the country of Chile over 160,000 uh, fell into our lap, or not really, it, was, it seemed to fall into our lap, but it was through the assiduous work of Susanna Clado. Um, she gained the opportunity for us to put our mindset assessment into the survey that accompanied standardized tests. And what did we find? So these are increasing levels of family income, language exam, math exam. The growth mindset kids, 
kids who endorsed the idea that intelligence could be developed versus those who endorsed a fixed mindset. What you can see is that at every level of family income, those endorsing a growth mindset outperform those endorsing fixed mindset. But this difference was most pronounced at the bottom of the income distribution. A growth mindset was less frequent at the bottom of the distribution, but when a student espoused it, it had an outside, outsized effect. We're not saying that mindsets are the answer to poverty or that poverty doesn't have dozens and dozens of pernicious effects, but it led us to wonder whether one of the ways that poverty works to maintain itself is by having a growth mindset and how to act on it be less available to children. Well, at some point, people started asking the question, could you teach students a growth mindset? And would they profit from it? The first studies were done by um, Joshua Aronson, Catherine Good, and their colleagues, and show that, yes, you could teach college students or middle school students a growth mindset, and they would profit in terms of grades or achievement test scores. In one study, we took a group of seventh graders who were showing declining grades in math. Half of them were taught uh, useful study skills. The other half were taught a growth mindset and how to apply it to their schoolwork. They kicked off with this article, you can grow your intelligence. New research shows the brain can be developed like a muscle. They learned that the neurons in the brain, when they took on hard tasks and stuck to them, form new or stronger connections and over time they could grow their intellectual abilities. Their brains could get stronger. Now, both groups of kids had been showing substantial declines in their math grades, but, and, <laughs> uh, after the study skills program, they continued to show a decline, but after the growth mindset program, they, the decline ceased, and if anything, they showed a rebound. A number of growth mindset interventions followed, but at some point, a wacky, possibly foolhardy idea emerged, which remarkably Casbis believed in. This wacky, foolhardy idea was mostly had by David Yeager, and I say that with the utmost affection and gratitude. What was, what was so wacky? First of all, the study I just showed you by Blackwell et al. was eight sessions of one-on-one, -on -one in-person, growth mindset from highly trained um, uh, individuals who were worked with hours before each session and hours after each session. That would be impossible to scale up. That study alone cost at least $100,000, if not more. You could never scale that up. Also to scale up, oh wait, so we did that. We distilled it to under a, an hour total and we pilot tested it with thousands of students to make sure it did indeed induce a growth mindset. We'd have to send it over the internet. There was no vehicle in the early days and so 
In the early 20 teens, Dave Paunescu, one of our graduate students, Carissa Romero, another of our graduate students, and others set up a platform that could send these interventions out to schools all over the country or the world. That's now called PERTS, um, Platform for Educational Research that Scales. <laughs> Could we send it out and study its impact in a nationally representative sample? David Yeager raised funds and hired the top research firm that constituted our national sample and uh, arranged for the sessions to be held and the uh, material to be um, sent. Could we impact the grades and the course taking of these students across the country? But first, let me take a few minutes out to thank CASPIS for the incredible role they played in founding the Mindset Scholars Network, which is now a thriving, freestanding organization, and in incubating, gestating, delivering to fruition the national study, uh, the one I was just describing with a nationally representative sample. Margaret Levy, Ellen Konar. Ellen Konar was the person who had the idea of housing the Scholars Network at CASBIS and um, also of um, bringing grants to CASBIS. The two of them um, developed grants for funding fellows and scholars, developed the network here, hosted planning meetings, CASBIS did for the national study, hosted data analytic meetings after the data were collected, and really helped our study and the network become interdisciplinary. We were a bunch of psychologists, we still are, um, but the input from sociologists, economists, statisticians, and so forth were vital. So what happened in this study? I'm not allowed to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it's under review at a <laughs> big journal now, but just between you and me and like, <laughs> everyone live streamed and whatever, <laughs> in a, just a very general, off-the-cuff way, it had uh, the desired impact on the GPA, overall GPA, of the lower achievers um, in the national sample, who were in the growth mindset group compared to the control group. A year later, um, the growth mindset group took more advanced math courses. They took it at a higher rate. And this was true for both higher and lower achievers. And finally, the new finding, which I can only allude to, um, we discovered what makes a growth mindset take root and lead to higher achievement and greater challenge seeking. And we found that it had to lo a lot to do with the peer norms in the school, the peer norms that supported or did not support growth mindset behaviors. Um, how noteworthy were our results? Well, digging into the literature, we were really interested to find that when you look at the results from intensive, expensive, large-scale and inter educational interventions, even ones that had shown initial success in small-scale testing, 
uh, most of them fail. They produce zero effect. We were also fascinated to learn that even the most successful ones, the ones that are touted uh, widely, have modest effects. A year of schooling has a modest effect at, at this age. By the way, the study was with kids making the transition to high school. Um, uh, a year with an excellent versus average teacher has a modest effect. It has an effect. It's an important effect. It's a modest effect. And our one-hour intervention got a big chunk of that effect. But mindsets aren't just things that people cart around with them in their heads. Mindsets exist in context. They can permeate contexts. And that's what I want to show next. A few years ago, Sarah Jane Leslie and Andre Simpian set out to find out whether certain disciplines embodied a fixed mindset more than others. They polled scholars in 30 different academic disciplines, and they asked them, how much is success in your discipline due to brilliance that simply cannot be taught, fixed, or dedication, hard work, learning, etc. Now, every field said it was some mixture, but it turned out the more the, the discipline um, attributed success to sheer brilliance that can't be taught, the fewer women were earning PhDs in those fields, and the fewer African Americans were earning PhDs in those fields. Who were the culprits? Well, in the STEM fields, so this is just the number of women earning PhDs in um, 2011, I think. Um, but there was a 0.6 correlation between the fixed mindset of a field in a field a minus 0.6 correlation between, the, um, no, a, a, a point 0.6 correlation between um, a fixed mindset in the field and the women uh, earning PhDs in the field. So the big culprits were engineering, computer science, physics. But don't breathe a sigh of relief if you're in the social sciences and humanities because the same magnitude correlation held in those disciplines with fields like economics and philosophy having strong beliefs in brilliance as the only road or the main road to success and many fewer female PhDs and African American PhDs. But let's zero in on STEM professors themselves. What are they doing and how are they doing it? One month ago, Mary Murphy and her colleagues published a study of 150 STEM professors, uh, mostly teaching introductory STEM courses, and over 15,000 students that they had taught over a period of time. The professor's mindsets were assessed. Did they believe in fixed brilliance or um, abilities that could be developed? They were also observed in their classrooms uh, the first few days and when they give, gave back exams. The fixed mindset professors tended to say things like this, if it isn't easy for you, you don't belong here. The kid, these were often freshmen coming from 
different backgrounds, different degrees of preparation. Another one said, I don't want any stupid questions. Uh, Growth mindset professors said things more like, everyone here is capable of doing well and will work with you until that happens. Here's what happened in terms of students' grades in their STEM courses. These are the students of the fixed mindset professors. There's a huge achievement gap. These are the white or Asian students. These are underrepresented minority students. A huge achievement gap. But notice something else. Everyone did better with the growth mindset professors. At the same time, the achievement gap was cut in half. They also, ooh, Uh, They also looked at course evaluations that these professors got. Um, So it wasn't that the growth mindset professors worked kids harder. Compared to other courses you've taken, how much time did this course require? About the same. It's not that one set of professors was more rigorous or demanding than the other. But... How much did your instructor motivate you to do your best work? Big difference. How much did the instructor emphasize learning and development? And this is overall because the course evaluations were anonymous. We're not pulling out underrepresented minorities. This is overall. And it turns out how much did your instructor motivate you to do your best work? how much did they emphasize learning and development, illuminated the relationship between the professor's mindset and the grade students earned. So, human potential. I think you can see it flourishing in one case and less so in the other. Now, I've been talking about mindsets as though they just affect individual achievement. But what about group efforts towards common goals? It isn't something we've studied a lot. It's something we want to study a lot more. But we've started to um, look at this in the context of organizations. With um, Mary Murphy in the lead, we um, studied a group of Fortune 500 companies. We asked employees in the companies the extent to which they thought their company value, believed in and valued fixed talent and versus the extent to which their company believed in and valued the development of everyone's talent. Interestingly, there was pretty good consensus within companies. And we found actually very large differences in other things as a function of the company's mindset. First of all, employees who perceived their company to be embodying more of a growth mindset said they felt much more empowered uh, than employees in the fixed mindset companies. Those in the growth mindset companies perceived more diversity and more support for innovative ideas. Not just support for the ideas, but if the ideas didn't work out, those in the growth mindset companies said the organization would have my back. This was a fascinating finding. Those in the fixed mindset companies, which we call cultures of genius, where everyone is trying to um, you know, show how smart and superior they are, uh, 
those people in the fixed mindset companies reported much more cheating, cutting corners, using any means to get ahead. <clears throat> in contrast, people in the growth mindset companies uh, reported much more support for teamwork in the service of group goals. They were creating a larger we rather than a very small I. In addition, I might point out Stephanie Freiberg and Mary Murphy, as well as data from the national study, will be used to um, study how uh, mindset contexts are created in schools and how we can help teachers embody uh, growth mindset um, con uh, practices in, in their uh, work. Okay. So this is my first conclusion. I told you I'd have several endings. Uh, so to conclude, we've shown the role of mindsets in the development of human potential. But what I'd like to do now is return and take a closer look at human potential itself. Neuroscientists are beginning to recognize that our claim to fame the prefrontal cortex that everyone thinks is the, just the sole seat of human brilliance, some neuroscientists are starting to believe it is not by itself the seat of human brain power. Instead, there are structures in the limbic system, so the uh, amygdala bodies, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, that coordinate signals from all over the brain, evaluate them, create motivation, make decisions, and send them to the cortex. Now, that's smart. I think they've been so neglected because they're considered ancient structures that uh, are emotional, not rational. But what if they're in charge and the cortex is just where they send their orders? <laughs> I'm actually studying that now. <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I've teamed up with some incredible neuroscientists in the medical school, and we're studying mindset-related neural circuits in the brain. We're tracking the messages sent from the limbic system to the cortex. We're studying whether and how growth mindset circuit, circuits can enhance learning, and whether they might even play a role in promoting and maintaining neural plasticity for learning in the brain. There is this incredible work now of neuroscientists being able to reopen critical periods that have, for all intents and purposes, closed. And one of the they can do it through genetic manipulation or psychopharmacological manipulations, but they can also do it through intense interest, motivation, and practice. So we want to know if the kind of motivation engendered by a growth mindset and the kinds of circuits that are primed uh, by a growth mindset uh, can play a role in reopening and maintaining uh, neural plasticity throughout life. So in this way, we hope to supplement that traditional view of a pure static intelligence that's sitting in the neocortex 
with a view of a much more dynamic intelligence that thrives on the growth mindset kind of motivation, the motivation to seek and enjoy challenges, the motivation to persist in the face of obstacles. And we also hope to supplant the modern view of um, each person having their own intelligence, which they use mostly to enhance their status or climb the hierarchy. Um, 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 so wait, I lost. Yes, to advance their personal agenda, to climb the hierarchy, to rise to the top. I googled human potential, and here are some of the first images I found. Like, what's he gonna do when he gets to the smoking? when he gets to the smoking pillar or the smoking podium, whatever it is. I'm telling you, these were the first images. What's that person going to do? How do you fulfill your uh, potential or anyone else's standing on a rock? What's she going to do when she finishes dancing? What's that person going to do? Who are they going to lead, inspire? Um, how, where is that human potential going? So we hope instead, building on our organizational work and in the spirit of great work by Hazel Marcus on interdependence, Greg Walton on belonging, Bill Damon and uh, David Yeager on self-transcendent purpose. We hope to replace this lone view with a view of each person embedded in and contributing to the organizations and societies they inhabit. Not lone individuals, but interlocking pieces of a larger puzzle. To really conclude, in our view then, human potential becomes a dynamic, growing attribute arising from motivated brains and used by humanity to move the world forward, to move it forward toward common goals. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, okay. before that this was heavy. Thank you. Thank you for the award and the warning. In addition to this richly deserved award, in addition to this rich, richly deserved award, there is also a what we like to think of as a reasonably substantial Check. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you are very, very, very welcome. Let's have another round. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. <laughs>